Okay, um, thank you very much for inviting me to, to give this talk today. Um, as a brief uh, introduction of myself, um, I have a background in biology that moved forwards into ecology and then more to soil ecology. Um, I'm a reader in ecology at uh, the University of Central Lancashire. Uh, and prior to working here, I was at the Open University in Milton Keynes. Um, my role now, or one of my roles at UCLan, is to head up the Earthworm Research Group, the ERG. And what I'd like to do today is talk at uh, some length, but hopefully not too long, about some of the uh, elements of the research I've been involved with over the past third of a century. Okay, um, before we start, earthworms. Everybody's familiar with earthworms. And at a species level, they can be distinguished by their size, by their behavior, by their color. And of course, not forgetting that each um, adult, as shown here, has uh, juvenile or hatchling stages, even cocoons that would look very different. So there is a need to be familiar with all life stages of earthworms. And obviously in the work, uh, the research work that's undertaken, we don't just look at individual species, we look at communities of earthworms and are so often involved with counting how many per square area, the density of earthworms, uh, how much by, by mass, the biomass in the same sort of area, and looking at the, the assemblages of the different species together, and maybe even over time, how these change. And one of the things I'm going to focus on today is talking about long-term monitoring because I think it is quite important and all too often uh, research projects uh, happen over short periods of time and perhaps miss some of the subtlety of changes that might take place uh, with events that might be more important over the longer term. Just to highlight a couple of species that uh, may be not so familiar to, to everybody, although members um, of this society perhaps have seen these before, there are some quite small earthworm species uh, in Britain. Uh, here's one of them that uh, is perhaps, I think it's considered to be quite rare, but actually uh, when you look for it, uh, you can find them uh, relatively easily. But unlike some of those I showed before, this one doesn't have a, a common name. And I'm indebted to uh, Frank Ashwood for provision of these worms, um, which came to our lab and we've been uh, keeping for the last couple of years or so. And these, as you can see from these adults, uh, are very tiny earthworms. Um, seems strange the way perhaps this uh, caption is given, but this was to show to school children as part of some outreach project that I'm involved with at the moment, uh, just so that they understood perhaps that these were tiny and the Latin name was perhaps less important to them. Anyway, just to give you a notion of what I intend to speak about, um, it's listed here. I'm going to try to avoid talking too theoretically about anything, although there is a need to mention ecosystem services, because, of course, that's why earthworms are of interest, because of their provision to us of these natural activities that they undertake, burrowing through the soil, casting on the soil surface, incorporating materials into the soil, let alone breaking down organic matter uh, and again making these nutrients available uh, for use in soils. So this underlies everything I'm going to talk about um, because I think it's really important when looking at research, and this is something I've tried to abide by over the years, is that it is of an applied nature, although sometimes there is a need to understand the basics before you can move on to actually utilising uh, what it is you want these earthworms to do for you, perhaps, or figuring out what they are actually doing and how we may gain from that. So I'm going to zip around a little bit and talk about projects in this country, talk about projects um, certainly up in Scotland and in Finland. And had there been more time, perhaps I'd have, I'd have included other things as well. But this is just a snapshot, I guess, of some of the research I've been involved with um, over the years. Just to kick off with the ecosystem services idea from the uh, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, um, the idea that there are these various services that are available to us, and maybe earthworms in a small part provide food to certain indigenous people. Um, there may be some sort of 
aesthetic cultural aspect involved in earthworms. There's a, an earthworm trail that you can follow in Germany and you can go and learn about some of the larger earthworms that live there. Obviously, in terms of climate regulation, and I'll come back to this towards the end, um, earthworms are important. Uh, flood regulation, water pur purification with the way that it moves through soils. But of course, perhaps the major um, impact of earthworms come from those supporting services where they are involved with soil formation, pedogenesis, and nutrient cycling and primary production, and it goes on. And we could spend a long time talking about this, but, but I'm not going to I want to talk about the projects uh, rather than the, the background. Um, this is a, a, what I call a cartoon that I put together a few years ago now, and I quite like this because it tries to simplify what earthworms look like. And if you have any knowledge of uh, earthworms found in this country, you might be immediately able to identify which earthworms these represent. And based, going back to what I said earlier, on basic size, uh, shape and colour. And these were drawn specifically for um, a group called uh, Riverford, who wanted to undertake uh, an earthworm survey of their own for their members. And uh, this they called it the Big Worm Dig. It took place a, a few years ago. And they took those um, cartoons that I'd drawn redrew them themselves, I'm not quite sure if they improved upon them in doing so, but try to use them in a, in a way to really for children to try and see if they could assist with uh, the way in which they identified the worms that they found in the soil. Um, obviously, this is not down to uh, the level that we would hope for uh, identification uh, using uh, the sort of guides that you're probably familiar with, the Opal Guide, uh, for example. Um, but it does require that uh, the, the children, uh, the participants in the surveys, learn something about the fact that there are different earthworms. Because um, certainly 50 years ago uh, and more, when people were taught in schools, there was probably just a notion that it was the common earthworm, the earthworm, possibly with reference to Lumbricus terrestris. But there is a need now, and there is actually a growing awareness of. Uh, there being so many more uh, earthworms in the soil. And of course, this society is, is leading uh, with the uh, assistance in that understanding. So there's a lot of work that I get involved with, with various people at various times uh, here, uh, looking at some earthworms collected from the soil. And if you look to the left of the picture there, you can see that we're using an electrical apparatus rather than what might be considered standard earthworm collecting. But as always, people are fascinated by earthworms. And this is one of the wonderful things, um, all ages, uh, all genders, everybody is interested in earthworms. So if we go back to where we were at the start with those four pictures, and I've put alongside them now the images that I've drawn uh, that I think represent them, they might differ slightly in colour, things are not totally uh, the same colour uh, all the time, the variation is there, but you can see that perhaps this is a way that might uh, assist in this idea of uh, assisting with citizen science. Okay, uh, again, very, very fundamental, something that uh, most people listening will be familiar with. We can roughly divide earthworms into three groups, epigeics that live near the soil surface, possibly within or around organic matter, uh, endogeics slightly further down, uh, possibly uh, horizontal, uh, non-permanent burrows, Geophagus eating soil uh, and living there. And then the, the deeper burrowers, the, the anaseek earthworms, semi-permanent vertical burrows, uh, possibly feeding from the soil surface, casting at the soil surface. And there are obviously interactions between these groups of earthworms. And it's something we've done an awful lot of work on in the laboratory, but I'm not gonna dwell on that today. This looks like a very complicated figure and you could suggest that it is. But all I want to do is say that there are those three types of earthworms shown in color towards the top. Epigeics, the composting type worms, those that live in or around organic matter, and their interest is down the left-hand side there with the decomposition of organic matter. I'm not gonna focus on that today at all. I'm gonna look more at the anaseek, the deep burrows, and the endogeic, the shallow working earthworms, and how they 
offer some of those ecosystem services that we talked about earlier on. And this is really where my focus has been over the past few decades. It's been with these soil dwelling earthworms rather than those that break down organic matter. Now, last year I know there was a great talk and it focused very much on composting worms. So I don't think I need to talk about them today. And if there are any questions that come up about them, I'm prepared to try and answer them, but perhaps there'll be other people present who would know better than I. So my interest really is in those that live within the mineral soil. And okay, these are the things again, rather than a table that are listed here as the services that are offered by earthworms to us. And I've sort of highlighted, although it doesn't look very clear, um, some of those that I've been involved with over time. The breakdown of organic matter, incorporation of this material into soils, perhaps focusing on deep burrows, deep burrowing species, and looking at casting and, and the likes as well. One of the things I should say from the outset is that uh, Lumbricus terrestris, the lobworm, the dewworm, the twatchel, the squirrel tail, for giving some of its common names, is and has been the focus uh, of my research uh, to, a, to a great extent. So quite a lot of the work that, gonna, that I'm going to describe to you will relate to Lumbricus terrestris. Okay, again, looking at some casting, obviously the stuff on the left you will have seen, I've no doubt, in your own lawns and in grassland, uh, that from the, the black-headed worm, Aparectidia longa, the long worm it's also called. And, but here's some other stuff that I came across uh, on, on, a, on a trip with the university and had no idea what earthworm it was and could not extract the earthworm from the soil. Um, so again, there's, there's quite a lot uh, that we still don't know uh, about earthworms in various places. Briefly, before we go any further, and this is something, again, you'll all be familiar with, I would guess, but it's worth mentioning, um, earthworms, hermaphrodite, but in most instances require the mating of two adults. Uh, Lumbricus terrestris is exceptional because they mate on the soil surface, so we can actually see this taking place at times. The two shown here were actually in my garden, or rather one was in my garden, one came from under the fence next door, saw them early morning uh, many, many years ago, and they gave me this opportunity for a photograph. Having mated, they produce cocoons underground. These cocoons hatch into small earthworms, hatchlings, which grow to maturity. No larval stages, very, very straightforward. Okay, and here's another pair of uh, terrestrials uh, in the act of copulation, uh, a process that can take uh, a couple of hours or more and something whereby they keep their tails in the burrows but lock themselves together very, very tightly using specialized CT, specialized uh, hook-like, um, hair-like proje projections on their body. And this allows the external passage of sperm in a reciprocal uh, way. We did some work some time ago, uh, Visa Newtonen and I, on um, earthworms, on terrestris and their mating behavior, and learned an awful lot about this sequence and how it comes about. And perhaps what was most interesting was the fact that there are mutual um, burrow visits, reciprocal bur burrow visits by each earthworm to its potential mate before mating occurs. And sometimes decisions are taken not to mate. And although we didn't do the work ourselves, it was later found that this was probably um, size assortative selection, whereby the animals were checking out the size of the potential mate to ensure that the worm that they mated with was of a similar size. And this was really to ensure that when they separated after that tight copulation with those CT, that one worm didn't pull the other from its burrow, which can occur if there is a large worm and a small worm. And this is important because um, both um, are acting as a male and a female, so they both want to be successful in the reproduction of themselves and their partner. So it's quite useful if they can ensure the offspring from their own fertilization and the fertilization of the partner worm takes place. This is a diagram I've put in simply because a lot of people ask me how are earthworm cocoons produced and this is where the clitellum comes into play, the, the saddle, uh, the ring of tissue that's found on adult worms and it's where uh, proteinaceous material is produced 
uh, forms a cylinder, slips forwards, or the, the earthworm reverses out of it underground. And as it passes uh, the place, uh, the ovaries where eggs are deposited uh, and uh, the sperm store where sperm is deposited, and then it slips off the front end, the two ends close to form a lemon shaped cocoon underground. Um, only twice during collecting earthworms from the field have I extracted an earthworm with a partially formed cocoon around itself. And um, so it's, it was interesting. It was, it, these were both terrestrial, and it showed that uh, obviously uh, this was how things take place. But uh, uh, not something I've actually filmed, something that would be great to be observed uh, on camera. There's a, a project for someone in the future. Excuse me. <laughs> Looking at um, basic uh, life history, um, this is something we've done in our laboratory with many different species of earthworm. This is with Lumbricus terrestris and having collected cocoons, which can be sieved out of soil where adults have been kept, they can be put into petri dishes, kept at constant temperature or varying temperatures to uh, obtain the, the hatching of those uh, worms, of those cocoons uh, eventually. And one of the things we were interested in in this experiment was looking at the nature of the food that was given to the earthworms and whether it mattered in terms of the number of cocoons that were produced. And we were comparing two basic types of food, um, horse manure and birch leaves, and found that they were generally much the same until, uh, as you can see in that figure, the birch leaves took off at a, a great uh, rate. And that's because I ran out of um, were of, of leaves that had been collected in the autumn and actually took some from the tree that was still green. And obviously these green leaves then uh, led to greater um, production of cocoons. So the type of food that worms get is very important for their reproductive output. Um, obviously you can measure growth in the laboratory as well, keeping worms in tubs, again, constant temperature incubators. And here you see the effects of the growth of uh, hatchling uh, terrestris uh, by, by temperature. Um, moving to the field, obviously uh, what we want to do is find out what worms can do for us in the field. And what you see here are two photographs of sections from uh, a reclaimed site at a place called Hillingdon in the, in the south of England, near Heathrow Airport. And this is where some um, organic matter in the form of so-called top grow had been added, uh, a mixture of a sewage sludge and, and mineral soil. And the difference there is that after a period of time, the presence of earthworms meant that this material had been incorporated and where uh, there were no earthworms, it wasn't, it was as simple as that. Um, so these animals were doing a great service in the soil. This was a site that had been set up by uh, a great researcher called Clive Edwards uh, before he went to the USA. And I might take this point just to say uh, that Clive died this year and he was a great influence on myself and the earthworm community and will be sadly missed. This is something we looked at over some time um, in uh, our research. And this was a thing we called the earthworm inoculation unit technique, the EIU. And um, this was growing worms in plastic bags with a view that we would use our knowledge from the laboratory to maximize their cocoon production and get some of those cocoons to hatch so that we had all, all three life stages in the plastic bag after a period of weeks, if not months. And then those plastic bags would be taken to the field and the community, if there were two species present or the uh, monoculture of earthworms would then be inoculated into the soil, keeping the earthworms and the mix in which they were present in, in a unit by splitting away and taking the plastic envelope away and putting them to a hole in the ground. And this is something we did quite a lot of work on uh, some years ago. And I think we learned a lot, but there's so much more again that can still be learned from putting worms out into soils where they're not present. And they were going into degraded soils. These We were using landfill caps because they were quite hostile and we saw it as putting this technique to the test. And I think it worked really quite well under the given circumstances, but uh, indeed there's still so much more that could be done. We use here Aparectidia longa and saw spread over a period of 10 years of about 130 meters um, away from the points of inoculation. Um, really quite exciting, um, quite interesting to, to look at these, these animals. And it's something that we then took further in, in various ways. 
Um, this was done in collaboration with forest research, and we were looking at the growth of trees on site, um, although those trees, because of the nature of the soils, didn't do particularly well. But um, we learned an awful lot, and it led to further projects thereafter. And uh, what we tried to do was look at the effects of uh, rotivating the soil uh, and incorporating organic matter in isolation and in combination, utilizing uh, Aparectidia longa and Labophora chlorotica. And you can see from those results there that uh, the addition of the organic matter was a big positive, um, but uh, the rotivation was, was quite a negative. Um, this was done on a relatively small scale, um, but there was a need perhaps to take this further and grow it and look at other, uh, other sites. And this is something that um, Frank Ashwood uh, picked up with, with his research. And this was undertaken in Essex, looking at um, adding trees to site, different species of tree, adding organic matter uh, in the form of composted green waste and putting in earthworms as well in various combinations. Um, you can see how the site developed over time uh, from practically a bare soil to the trees starting to become uh, quite established. And here's some of uh, the results from that publication shown there um, with uh, the growth of the, the trees over time. Um, the earthworm aspect here probably wasn't as, as significant as it might have been. And maybe this was a function of the way that the earthworms were put into site. We knew this at the time, but it was the only technique that was available um, for this particular project. But um, this is something that is being looked at. This, this has been monitored thereafter. And it's part or will form a part of a, a PhD that's heading towards completion at the moment, looking at similar sites across the country where composted green waste has also been used uh, as a part of a soil amendment. Moving over to Finland, um, here's a site, a, a place called uh, Kotkanoja, uh, which is a, a name of a field in Finland, where you can see the uh, strips of land there, some of which are conventionally tilled and some have uh, no-till. And uh, we looked here, this, this site had no Lumbricus terrestris in it, even though some fields nearby did have. So we took the opportunity back in the 1990s to put some terrestrials into these fields. So they were inoculated using the EIU technique um, around the margins and at the leading edge to, to the top of the field as you saw it before. And you can see here where the um, earthworms were put in with these white circles on the margins and the um, black circles within the, within the field. Um, the crosses are where we sampled in, at a later date. Um, some of the results we found were that the, the number of individuals, certainly in the boundaries and the field boundaries, increased quite rapidly, but the number of individuals within the field themselves uh, took some time to get going, but they did start to pick up. Um, and we found that there was perhaps here a, a clear influence of subdrains in the field because this was a heavy clay uh, site and there was a need for um, drainage in order to make the, or make the conditions suitable for earthworms to survive. Bearing in mind that this is uh, in Finland where they have quite um, severe frosts in, in the winters. Um, we went back in the winter to find out what was going on. Slight aside, this was a different field, but it was something for us to try and figure out what worms did in the winter in places where the soil might freeze down to half a meter. And we dug down, or rather the machine dug down, and then we started taking samples within the wall of the, um, uh, the excavation and found that the terrestrials top right there were down right at the bottom of their burrows, sitting vertically upwards, nose up, um, with the burrow above them towards the surface totally frozen, no way of freezing, no way of feeding, but able to survive just by sitting out the winter. The Collaginosa, uh, just below Upper Ectodia Collaginosa, coiled themselves up and survived in uh, an estivation type chamber uh, up near the soil surface. But the bigger ones um, tried to burrow down. And, and this was a, a quite a, an interesting finding that the, the bigger worms actually uh, these endogenic worms made deeper burrows in the winter. Cocoons were found in the upper layers and on uh, defrosting, on thawing the, the soil, they hatched almost immediately. Um, so these had some natural uh, sort of antifreeze that kept them alive during the winter in frozen soils. Uh, and that gives an indication of how the drainage um, 
position of the soil drains and the freezing of the soils had an effect on uh, all of these fields where the earthworms could survive. So where there was drainage present and where the soil froze from above, there was a small part of the soil um, profile that, was made, that remained either uh, water-free or frost-free, allowing for growth of the population of terrestrials more than in areas where there was no drainage. Okay, so returning to Kopkanoya, uh, we kept sampling there. We've continued to sample there. I'm hoping to go back again and keep looking because we're still learning from this inoculation that took place in the late 90s. And we found that the spread, the, the, the movement forward of those zones from the top towards the bottom of that figure increased. Um, we, didn't, we didn't put these into the, the conventional tillage. These were in the, uh, the no-till areas. Uh, and you can see, um, sorry, direct drill, I should call it. Um, and uh, you can see that the, uh, the fronts were moving at a different rate in the, in the two reps. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, we also looked in uh, at other soil fauna to see if the presence of the Lumbricus terrestris were having an effect on the nematodes, enchytreids, other and other earthworm species. And these are some of the results that, that were obtained. And effectively, what it shows is that um, the earthwork, the presence of Lumbricus terrestris did have an effect, was affecting these, um, these other worm species in the soil. And I think this is something we have to be aware of, that the, the action of our um, earthworms isn't just on the earthworms themselves and on the soil, but it's on other species, on other groups within uh, the soil profile. I won't dwell on this because I want to try and show you as much as I can. Um, in another setting, this was a set of experiments that we uh, undertook uh, in, in a sort of laboratory setting. We offered up um, straw to Lumbricus terrestris. We gave uh, a, a large collection of straw in one area to see what happened. You can see that those collections of straw, the small ones on the soil, soil surface to the left, are where um, uh, there is a burrow below, uh, and that's their midden. And you can see that what happened was that the the four lucky people or the four lucky earthworms whose uh, burrows came up very close to where that straw was put in a mass built big burrows. Excitingly thereafter, the, the ones that lived nearby started stealing some of that straw and there was a relay action and, and the straw was eventually spread across the whole of this arena that we had. And uh, we thought this is quite interesting. I wonder if this happens in, uh, on a larger scale in the natural world. And well, I say natural, this is a, an agricultural system, of course. And uh, a colleague and I, again, uh, Visa Newton, looked at what was happening in, in these Finnish fields and found that the similar type of activity was taking place. And we feel that this is something, again, that needs to be investigated further because, OK, wind and water are great ways of shifting organic matter around the soil surface. But it may well be that earthworms are playing a major role as well. And, and again, as I say, it's probably worth looking at in more detail. So we've mentioned it already, but let's just uh, be more specific. Lumbricus terrestris on the left here, exiting its burrow, having been encouraged to come out by the addition of some mustard powder and water. But prior to that, the midden has been removed, the collection of organic and sometimes inorganic material that sits on top, which is uh, an essential part of its uh, life. Um, you can also see a juvenile um, terrestrial in the left-hand picture. There are some uh, middens in an agricultural setting, uh, an agro-ecosystem on the left. There's a midden in a uh, garden setting, much more stone presence there. People often ask me, why do we get these little cairns on our driveway? It's because you've built a driveway over where earthworms live and they're trying to do what they can. Uh, the function of the midden, there are lots of thoughts on that. I'm happy to answer questions on that at the end. I could spend the next 10 minutes talking about that and nothing else. So terrestris with its burrow midden complex, as it's sometimes called, how do you find out about the burrows? Well, in the old days, people used to take sections and dig down and come to the conclusion that these burrows were quite vertical, as shown here. Um, so a few years ago, we sort of developed a technique of pouring polyurethane resin into burrows with a colored dye and it hardens and then you dig away the soil and then you see what's there thereafter. And uh, this sort of thing is what took place again in, in some Finnish research. And these 
burrows go down a meter. These are the tile drains. These are the drains I was talking about before. And here you can see that uh, it's not a coincidence that these burrows actually meet up with these drains. And in fact, the earthworms are utilizing that drainage that's present in the soil put in by us to assist water to escape down their burrows, down their macropores uh, into the, the drainage systems, interaction between us and them. Um, we looked at how much water can go into burrows. This was some work done in the States uh, a few years before that and uh, found out that it could be quite considerable, you know, a litre of, of water per minute. And it was even found that when the earthworms were still in the burrows, um, it didn't hinder the, the rate of water entering those burrows. Uh, and this was because the burrow was open, um, whereas when worms were present, they tend to get blocked up. Um, this, was, this was quite an interesting finding. Um, so middens across an agroecosystem, top left. Right hand side is a side burrow from a major burrow of Lumbricus terrestris, and it shows a cocoon that has been deposited at the end of that little side burrow. And then that has been blocked up with organic matter, its leaf material that we were feeding the, the adult. And the question is, is it blocking that burrow to perhaps uh, prevent predators from entering and potentially eating the cocoon? Or is it doing it to keep the cocoon moist or perhaps to offer food for the hatchling earthworm when it comes out of the cocoon? Lots of questions and we don't know the answers. Again, plenty of areas for research here. Um, one of my PhD students a long time ago looked at uh, this Lumbricus terrestris in some detail in a woodland area, had some plots that were fenced off, and she looked at the way in which she could manipulate the density by adding earthworms to those plots. But um, one of the major interests that came out of it was the way in which these, um, by mapping the uh, position of the burrows, how, how constant they were, how, how they stayed very much the same over time. And one of the things that came uh, from this was that these burrows tend to be recycled. So after, after the adults die, they are, they are potentially inherited by young earthworms or taken over by other earthworms that enter the, the site. And we found that on average, these burrows tend to be about 13 centimeters apart. And you might say, how can that be? Why would that be? But it's because there is a, a need in life for these animals to space themselves out so they don't compete for food, but equally they need to be close enough together in order to be able to reach a partner to mate. And it's those two factors that play a part in, in how these animals are spaced out. Um, more tree-related research, uh, another PhD student looked at short rotation forestry, SRF, and some exotic species in this country, such as uh, eucalyptus, and how terrestrials could live quite happily within uh, eucalyptus, and could indeed uh, do reasonably well with growth, and would even uh, take uh, this material and feed upon it when, when using litter bags, some with a very fine mesh to stop the earthworms accessing and some with a larger meth mesh to allow them access. Different species used to look at the preference of those species. In addition to feeding experiments, there were also choice chamber experiments. And again, different uh, species um, preferred over other species. Again, lots of time could be spent discussing these results, but I'll switch, uh, pass over them quite quickly now and uh, people can ask if they wish. Um, having looked at uh, the detail with other earthworm species, we also looked with um, terrestrials and found that they were some that they preferred over others. But once the preferred species had been eaten, then they moved on to the, uh, the less preferred species uh, using these so-called choice chambers, which were pie dishes with uh, Eppendorf pipettes added to them with amounts of known or known amounts of food within those uh, pipettes. Um, in addition to looking at uh, just weighing or taking the biomass of how much material had been taken, it was also possible to film Lumbricus terrestris because of its surface activity by setting up um, experiments using webcams and here offering up leaf discs of the same size taken from leaves of uh, different sizes in order to make sure that it was a fair type of experiment. Uh, using big buckets with a terrestris at the centre, it was possible then to film them and find out which um, leaf discs were preferred, whether they took all that they touched, whether they ignored some, um, or whether they uh, just moved them and abandoned them. And again, this was in quite, quite revealing um, research, but there's still so much more that could be done. 
I'm moving on again now. Perhaps I'm moving on too quickly. I don't know. But it will hopefully allow for us to have uh, the opportunity for questions at the end. But um, not long ago, a um, couple of, well, yeah, just a few years ago, a couple of years ago, and also about five or six years ago, um, I got the opportunity to go over to the Black Forest in Germany because there, um, there's a species called Lumbricus bedensis, which we don't have in the UK, um, but it's really quite interesting uh, for a number of reasons. And what we did there was, again, went to try and film what this animal was doing, because just like Lumbricus terrestris, it's active at the soil surface. And so we wanted to see something of its behavior uh, and how it might be affecting this particular type of a beech and a spruce dominated forest. So we took a whole host of um, webcams over there and set up to film for a number of nights using small batteries to power the, the cameras in the field. And it was quite an adventure, to be honest. And these are the sorts of things we saw. Here is a, a Lumbricus bedensis feeding. This was from our trip uh, six years ago. Uh, we also had a trip uh, another couple of years ago. And here is why perhaps this animal is of some interest because these get quite large. And this one was in excess of 40 grams. And uh, the cocoons, again, that they produce are very, very large. Uh, we've hatched these out in the laboratory. Um, I have about a dozen of these animals living in our laboratory. I, I would suggest they are probably the only Lumbricus bedensis uh, in this country, um, probably the only Lumbricus bedensis in the laboratory anywhere. But um, we're learning lots about them. We've, we've learned an awful lot about how they live in the field. There was already some ecological data, of course, but we've added to that. Um, we know now something that they feed and mate very much like uh, Lumbricus terrestris. Uh, the idea is, again, to, to try and learn more about this um, because we have this resource to try and work with. Um, the, the, the critical thing, though, is what the ecosystem services are they offering in the field? And I think there's a need when we've developed or when we have uh, more results to try and see if we can get back and do work with the people locally in, in Freiburg to try and see if we can grow the, um, the understanding of their actions, their services that they offer in those forests. Um, this is a place some of you may be familiar with. This is Down House in, in Kent, um, which was the home of, of Charles Darwin for 40 years. Uh, it's now uh, managed by English Heritage. And um, we were given the permission. We went down there um, some years ago to try and grow some of the knowledge that Darwin had published in his famous 1881 book, The Formation of Vegetable Mould. And uh, we tried to answer some of the questions that he left a little bit open, like which species of earthworm were present in, in those grounds of his. And we did that. And then as time went on, we thought there's much more we could learn here. And so we went to one of the fields, Great Pucklands Meadow, um, which he writes quite a lot about, as his sons called it the Stony Field. Uh, when he first moved there, it had been a ploughed field. It was covered with large flints. And it was reported that a horse couldn't gallop across it without throwing up a flint with every uh, land of its, uh, of its hooves. But over a period of years, those flints seemingly disappeared. And the question was, what had happened? And Darwin investigated by digging down and finding that they'd sunk down into the soil, which he put down to the action of worms. So we were given permission um, back in 2007 to replicate this, this investigation. So we set up some meter squares of flints that were uh, available, had been collected, whoops, had been collected locally, and um, set them out in small size, large size, high density, low density, uh, replicated um, four times each. And we were interested, obviously, in what was happening there and tried to observe uh, over time the action of earthworms on these flints. Uh, so this is one of the squares, for example, how it was set up in, in 2007. This is the large low. Um, and then after a period of six years, hopefully you can see, you can pick out the same pieces of stone uh, as present uh, in each of these. 
And then we went back again um, four years ago, and you can see again, those same stones are present, but obviously um, perhaps they've been incorporated. And what we're doing each time um, is trying to figure out the rate of burial. And we do this, or we've done it so far, by taking a quarter of each of those uh, units, each of those square meters, and digging out the stones or pulling out the stones as best we can without making too much disturbance, and then measuring the deepest um, projection of depth of that stone into the soil. And we're starting to build some results. And these results are of some interest, I think. And uh, we will continue with this possibly over, we've still got two more uh, quarters to, to revisit or to visit. And then we could potentially go back to those that were visited, what will be decades before by their time that comes around. And, and, and I know full well that uh, when I've retired, there are people who, who will pick up on and take this forward because I think it's something that could be, again, long-term is, is important. Um, we try to replicate things in the lab as well, got some results, but not quite as good because um, we needed larger areas. But that's again, something that could be repeated. Just taking you up to Scotland very briefly to the Isle of Brom. I've done lots of work on the Isle of Brom over the last 25 years or so. And it's an exceptional place. It's considered an outdoor laboratory. Um, the people who now work for Nature Scott, as, as, as it's now called, are, are very keen to have research done there. And um, there's evidence of past management through crofting, um, lots of so-called lazy bed formations in the landscape. Trees have been planted, the trees have affected soils, earthworms are present in some of these areas, and it's very, very fascinating. Um, one of the areas up on the hill um, has green spaces on barren uh, locations, and some of this is brought about by the uh, burrowing and nesting of Manx shearwaters. And when they come in from the marine environment, they deposit their feces, which acts as a fertilizer, so marine to terrestrial uh, transference. And there are interesting signals in the soil uh, where that's taken place. There's also this square up on the hill, very unnatural, brought about by the addition of NPK by a researcher 30 years ago. So we looked at both of these areas and we can see different signals in the isotopic uh, nitrogen as shown here on those areas. And again, it's, it's just, We've just scratched the surface. There's so much more that could be done in this area. Just very, very briefly, one of the techniques that we thought was very, very useful, has proved useful to us already, is marking earthworms, tagging earthworms using visual implant elastoma. And this has enabled us to undertake population-related studies, such as those as, as Nikki Grigoropoulou's in those meter squared forest plots. And we've also been using it more recently in the laboratory to track worms in ecotoxicology experiments. There's so much that could be used, uh, that this could be used for. Um, here's a big worm we found up in Scotland at a place called Papadil. You can see it's got a tag in it because we put that in before we released it. Again, lots of things that can be done uh, in the future. Just going back to uh, ecosystem services briefly, there's a whole host of ways in which we can consider what is happening in our soils and a whole host of ways in which earthworms and their products can be used to assist. And possibly, if you look down the left-hand side there, um, we've got to overcome some ways in which earthworms have become uh, invasive species and are actually a problem to us. Ongoing research in our lab, we've got someone working on the Isle of Rum looking at um, revitalizing those um, marginal um, abandoned agricultural systems from 200 years ago, growing potatoes up there. We didn't get up there last year because of COVID, but hopefully we'll be back in the spring to start that up again. We've got people back in the labs now looking at ecotox, particularly of silver nanoparticles in agri agricultural systems, again, food production systems, which may have come through, through the sewage sludge uh, avenue. We've also got people investigating uh, earthworms interacting with cover crops and plant pathogens, 
This is in collaboration with researchers in Austria. And again, we're, as mentioned before, um, looking at uh, relationships between earthworms, different lineages here. There's just a figure shown looking at a lullaby, a lullaby a, a chlorotica. And of course, lots of long term ongoing projects. And this I can't stress too much. Um, there's some that I haven't even mentioned here that have been running for uh, 20 years and more. This is something I just put in because it's we can't ignore it. Climate change is taking place. Um, people have drawn together data on earthworms from across the globe and try to figure out what matters, what's important. And some of the results were quite interesting and it seems to suggest whichever type of model that you look at, um, that rainfall events uh, are important. And there's just so much happening at the moment, so much change that um, it could well be that we need to really, really think about what's happening with this climate crisis. And we need to think about what it means to us, what it means to earthworms. And if we didn't have any earthworms, how their, the, the removal of those services we get from them could drastically affect our lives, if nothing else, through crop production. Um, you know about Darwin, everyone knows about Darwin and earthworms. Gilbert White before him also wrote about earthworms in his Natural History of Selborne. We know they're really important. They knew they were really important. We've got to remember this for the future. And I'd just like to uh, say, yeah, it, you know, what would happen if there were no earthworms in the world? We'd be in real problems. Let me finish up just with a, a blatant advert uh, and at the same time, thank uh, the ESB for inviting me to give this talk. I hope you've got questions you might like to put to me. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, yeah, I didn't know about that book, so that's good to know. Um, I, I'm sure I'll get it for Christmas um, in 2022 by somebody if I haven't got it before then. Um, Emma, have you got anything that you want to ask before we open the floor for questions? We'll give you chairs, chairs preference there. Do you want me to shop, stop sharing my screen here? Yeah, Kevin, that's fine too. Okay. You're on mute, Emma. <laughs> um, we've got a number of questions in the chat, which we'll go to, but if anybody would like to jump the queue, <laughs> we will allow people to jump the queue by raising their virtual hand. So raise your hand to ask a question. Emma, have you got anything you'd like to? No, I just wanted to say thank you so much for that, Kevin. I really, really enjoyed that. And I'm definitely also ordering that book. It, ha it hasn't been published yet. I haven't. Oh, it's, 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 it's just about to be submitted for publication. That's the, that's the point it's at. <laughs> ah, well, that's really exciting. Was that your lockdown project? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. That's a very good lockdown project. But no, I will leave the, the, the floor for... Sorry. Okay, we, we've got no hands up. Um, so Anka, um, I know that Frank has been answering a lot of questions in the chat as well. Are there any that... Yeah, there, there's still uh, some left over that um, Frank didn't um, completely cover, and then some that he talked a little bit about, but um, thought that, um, you know, we could ask here as well. Um, the first question came from Sally, and she asked, what happens if a predator comes along while they're joined in mating? Okay. Um, the, the first thing to say is they tend to mate at night. So by doing, by undertaking their, their copulation at night, they avoid most of the diurnal predators. Should um, a fox or uh, another a badger or something come along and, cap, and, and, and find two earthworms mating, um, they probably get quite a tasty meal, I would suggest. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then Linda Pryke was asking, um, by what mechanisms and over what distance do uh, Lumbricus terrestris disperse? Okay, it's a good question. Um, 
The first, the first thing is to say um, they tend, once they, they have a semi, semi-permanent burrow, they tend to stay there um, because it's in their nature to want to be near other uh, Lumbricus terrestris and in an area where they can survive. Um, the mechanisms that bring about them choosing to move um, are often the ability to move over wet ground. They don't want to move over dry ground because it will be very difficult. And this is why earthworms disperse after it rains. They're not, they're not moving to escape drowning. They're moving because they are able to use it as a way to colonize other areas. Um, over what distance does, do they move? The literature reports uh, a movement of about 20 meters in one evening. This, will, this wasn't a uh, linear movement, it was a circular sort of movement recorded. Um, and I think, yeah, this is, this is perfectly uh, credible. And I think they could probably move even more than 20 meters in, a, in an evening. They're only gonna settle though, where they detect the presence of other Lumbricus terrestris because they need that for mating. Okay, I'm going to jump to Anthony because he's no. got his hand raised, Anthony. Then we'll that. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, my question, Kieran, straightforward is, uh, what's the name of your book, Kevin? I didn't catch that. It's called Worm. Okay, brilliant. Excellent. So, or we've had a question. Really, it will be. <laughs> we've had a question in the chat asking about when it's published, will, will members be informed? Can I just check, Kevin, who's it aimed at? It's, it's, it's really a, a general science type book. So it's for, any, for anyone. It, it, doesn't, it, has, it has some of the material that I've just spoken about within it, but probably given in a slightly different way. So, yeah, so I think that's definitely something I'd be looking to put in the, um, in the newsletter. Um, and if anybody, any of our members would like to nominate themselves to review it and write an article for us, I'll throw in a free copy of the book on behalf of the Earthworm Society because we, we'd love to get somebody to review it. Obviously, we can get Ke Kevin to write an article, but he might be a little bit biased. <laughs> <laughs> it, would be good to have a, it would be good to have a novice review it as well and tell us what they found. So get in touch with me if, you, if you're interested in doing that. Thanks for that question, Anthony. Great question. Uh, Anka, back to you then. Yep, we still have quite a few questions. So Asmina, um, she asked a couple of questions, um, which Frank also answered in the comments, but I'm not sure if anybody or everybody was able to read the comments while um, the lecture was going on. So she asked, it's a two-parter here. You know, we are planning to put over a thousand trees in our borough. Do you think it is worth thinking about earthworms? And she said, um, we're also thinking about doing a pollinator corridor. Do you think we need, again, need to think about introducing earthworms? Um, if you're putting the trees in, I think the answer is probably yes. Um, depends on the species of tree, depends on the type of soil, depends on, and it goes on, that there are so many factors that can influence um, even your tree survival, let alone anything else and the type of earthworms that you then choose to put in, if you opt to do so, may well be determined by those factors I just mentioned. Um, what was the second question about? Sorry, pollinator survey. A pollinator corridor. Corridor, sorry, okay. Earthw earthworms are good for everything, is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also had a couple questions about um, middens. So um, Kate was saying that um, you said that you might be able to tell us a bit more about the purpose of the middens. And Dan was asking about um, whether or not there was a major difference in the nutrient composition of earthworm middens or castings of different species. Okay, take the first one first. Um, okay. Function of middens, they may well function in a physical way to prevent moisture loss from the burrow. So that's, that's one almost certain um, function. Um, they may also act as a, a signpost to other earthworms, to other terrestrials, that there is a, a, a viable earthworm there when it comes to potential mating. Um, they may act as a store for organic matter um, and a small compost heap where that matter is degraded by microbes so that the earthworm itself can feed upon that material. 
They may act as a nursery for the hatchling Lumbricus terrestris when they exit the parental burrow, because we have found that there are large numbers of terrestrial hatchlings and other earthworm species in the middens by comparison to non-midden areas nearby. And in answer, there, there are other, there are more and more and more potential, we, we need to do lots of research on this. Um, in answer to the nutrient question, yeah, the nutrients within the um, middens are much greater usually than the nutrients in surrounding non-midden soil because of the additions of the organic matter that the, the earthworm brings there. Sorry, I kept myself on mute there. Okay. Um, we, we've got, I think we've got another question from Anthony Anka. So, oh, go on, I, Anthony. My rule, yeah. my rule is hand up, you cut in. So, okay, thanks, Kieran. Uh, just to say, Kevin, um, in the past, we've had a lot of people get in touch with us about you know introducing earthworms into uh, their garden or allotment, that sort of thing. And and as a society, you know, we've we've said, oh, you know, native earthworms, but we haven't recommended any kind of suppliers or anything like that. I'm aware that there are worm farms out there. What a question I have is around if earthworms, which were native species, were introduced into an area, you say that uh, terrestrials stay, you know, relatively in, in, in the sort of same location once they've established. I mean, um, is there any guarantee that, you know, if you get earthworms, you put them in a, in a particular area, that they are going to stay within that, within that defined uh, space, whether that's a garden or allotment? You know, you say that um, terrestrial disperses. Um, what's your, what are your thoughts on that, please? Okay, the, the first thing I'd say is um, the, the source of your inoculum is quite important. And if you, if you buy in Lumbricus terrestris from commercial suppliers, chances are they've come from Canada. Right. Chances are they've been collected in the field there, kept in cold storage and shipped over here, primarily okay. for, fi for fishing bait, but people then also buy them to put into their soils. Um, these animals may not be very well adapted to our soils. Yeah, that's right. That's what I was thinking about this yeah. issue. They're, yeah. they're not they're not used to our conditions, and you know, uh, they're they're in a sense introduced. You know, yeah. So 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 that's possibly not the best way forward. What we would always argue alongside um, people who introduce trees into area is the you, you look for local provenance if possible, because it makes sense that you're going to. Yeah. Yeah. You're, going to put, you're going to put animals in that are likely to be able to survive in that area. Um, okay. Yeah, there, I mean, that, that fits with what I've said about, you know, try to get, you know, earthworms that are, you know, local to the, to the region where they're living. You know, if they, if they are looking to introduce them and they make sure that they're natives, obviously. And the, and, the on, and the only other question, of course, that we always need to ask before we do this sort of thing is, why are there no earthworms there? Yeah, absolutely. Because if, yeah. if the... You know, if the, the soil is in some way toxic, then it doesn't matter how many earthworms you put in, they'll all die. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. or where they come from. So, so I think there's a need for some homework before any such thing takes place. Yeah. Okay. That, that chimes with what I've, you know, the, the sort of advice that we've, I've been given. So good. Something so, I'll just add there <coughs> is that the anecdotal evidence that I've got from people that have tried to improve their gardens or, or even just added a compost bin to their garden is that when they've built it, the earthworms have come, that they're really good at colonising and, and that they have seemed to find stuff. So, like Kevin has said, that's exactly what I was going to say. Why are there no earthworms there? Because if, if you don't fix the problem, the earthworms are not going to stick around, they're not going to survive there anyway. So I think, yeah, yeah. I, I've rarely advised gardeners to actually add earthworms. Yeah, it always amazes me, Kevin. Actually, I've got a question for you. I'm going to skip the Q anchor, I'm afraid, just in case you can answer this. One question that I get asked a lot and I have no answer for is so when we're looking for earthworms in the field, in the soil, we rarely find the the epigeic earthworms that specialize in high organic matter microhabitats. So the composting earthworms like Dendrobina venita and mm -hmm. Icenia fetida or the, the tiger or branding worm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we never find that in the soil, or very, very rarely. Yet, if you put a compost bin in your garden, it seems to naturally colonise it. So are you able to shed any light on how these earthworms find these compost bins and how far they're travelling, uh, et cetera? Yeah, I think you, you, I, I totally agree. I've, I've rarely, if ever, I've, once or twice I've found Icenia. 
um, but very rarely. Um, what they tend to do, I think these animals are very mobile. I think they're on the look, on the go all the time, looking for opportunities. These are opportunistic organisms. And when they find organic matter, they congregate in it and they, and they utilize it. They must be using olfactory cues or others to, to find this material. And um, I think some of them are so almost dependent upon us these days. Some of these species are, you know, anthropochorus or call it what you like, uh, anthropogenic, and they are they are intimately linked with us. And I think if we perhaps if we weren't around, maybe they wouldn't be around. Um, it's 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 quite interesting. It's something I thought about myself a number of times. It's it's. It, and sorry, I must say this though. I must say this. This is this is quite important. People who. Um, have compost bins, have any sort of composting, and they, they produce lots of earthworms, should not think that if they take those earthworms and put them into the soil, they will improve their soil, because they won't. They'll just scoot back and find some more organic matter, as we've just discussed. Brilliant. OK. Anka, I think we've probably got time for one more uh, question. Um, so what's, what's the best question we've got left? Um... I was going to be really cheeky and ask a question that I was curious. I'll say about. what we'll fit two in because you've helped us out today. So let's take your question and then end on the the best one you've got from the chat. When okay. I say best, I mean the the most pressing question. The most pressing. Well, this um, might be a bit of a chonker here, but um, how do you think changing seasonality due to climate change will impact earthworm populations? Okay. It's very, it's very difficult to be definitive, of course. Um, if it becomes, obviously, okay, what, what don't earthworms like? They don't like dry conditions. So if we get drier summers, if we get drier any um, particular seasons, it's going to have a negative effect on the way in which earthworms can actually do what we want them to do in the soils. Because if the soil is dry at the surface, if the soil is dry any depth below the surface, we're going to lose that activity that we would normally expect to see. Um, equally, if we get colder winters, um, we'd, we'd get the same effect because of the frozen nature, as was as I mentioned with respect to Finland. Um, what we're likely to get is probably wetter weather, uh, wet, wetter climate. Um, but unfortunately, what we're equally likely to get is unpredictable. Mm -hmm. climatic events and I think that's what no one can really build into any sense at the minute and um, I, I fear that the um, this unpredictability will disrupt what might be considered the natural cycles the natural processes that take place and because of that as we've seen over recent um, weather in spring and summer it totally um, takes away the ability for certain crops to grow because they get hit at the wrong time with hot weather or with cold weather or with wet weather. And I think the same sort of thing could start to affect our earthworm species as well. Yeah, what I was afraid of, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, just there's one other question that's quite interesting from Ajay. I hope I haven't mispronounced the name. Um, can we categorize soil in terms of earthworm diversity? A lot of, yeah, I mean, <laughs> a lot of people have been looking at this, this type of investigation um, using the earthworms as indicators of soil quality. Um, and I think the French are really quite keen on this and have been doing this for, for some time. I say the French, that's a very loose term. Certain researchers in France, I should say, have been doing this. And um, I think there is some merit in it, but I think it... it, it you can tie yourself in knots if you're not careful with this. It's, it, it's less straightforward than might perhaps be initially seen. Okay. Yeah, I think there's been a really interesting paper on this out recently that, that, um, that says just that there's a lot of factors to consider. So soil health might not be the only thing. And I think you showed it, you showed a diagram, didn't you, towards the end of the talk that, that showed how models for different things have different weight. Um, right. Thank you very much, Kevin.